So hi everybody, it's 15.30 and we'd like to start on time. So thanks for joining our webinar about challenges, strategies and solutions in calf rearing. I am one of the panelists today. Uh, my name is Lina Faske and I am the responsible account manager for Dusk and Region when it comes to our farm solution products. With me, I have the host of this webinar, Miguel Correa, who spontaneously took over for our technical manager, Francisca Stemmer, who unfortunately is on sick leave today. Mr. Correa is the business account manager for the farm solution products as well. For further support, I would like to welcome Mr. Claudio Campanelli, who is the product manager for MasterSoft. Mr. Campanelli and I will support this webinar with both content and technical issues. May the two of you shortly introduce yourselves. Miguel. Well, thanks, Lina. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar and thank you very much for joining us. So my name is Miguel. My responsibility within EW Nutrition is the, as the business account manager of Farm Solutions within the European region. And I'm gonna have to cover the presentation today uh, on behalf of my colleague, um, Francisca Stemmert, who is not available today. Thanks, Miguel. And now our second panelist, uh, Italian expert, Claudio Campanelli. Yes, thank you, Lina. My name is Claudio Campanelli. As uh, Lina said, I'm Italian. I come from Italy. I had my work degree in, uh, in Milan, in a university in Milan in agri agricultural science. At the moment, uh, actually, I'm located here in Wiesbeck uh, in Germany and uh, in the headquarter of EW Nutrition in Wiesbeck, I'm actually the product manager for MasterSorb line. I, uh, I'm very happy to be here and to share the, uh, this webinar with Lina and Miguel and uh, I hope to help you in answering the questions that you can write in a Q&A session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I am pleased that today we not only have a fairly international team of speakers, but also a very international audience. So just a, a few technical points to explain the setup of this webinar. Um, Miguel will yeah. deliver his presentation of about 35 minutes. And during this presentation, you can ask questions in the Q&A box, which opens when you click on the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen. These questions are read and possibly answered in real time by us, the panelists. And if they require a longer or more complex answer, we will save them for the Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Yeah, once again, thank you for being here. And now let's get started. Okay, so let's kick off. As you all know, the title of these members carrying on these certain solutions and providing the work on for the first one similar data here in Europe. And in this chart, we, we see that about that we get related to... Miguel, sorry to interrupt, interrupt you, you, but uh, there is something wrong with, uh, with the, the sound. It's very difficult to understand you. So maybe there is something really? wrong with the microphone. What right. about now? You listen much better? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to stay closer probably to the mic. Thank you. So, for, for I'm gonna, yeah, no, that's fine. Sorry. So, as I was saying, we will divide this webinar in four points. So, challenges in cap rearing. Uh, 
this is a we have similar figures here in Europe and this chart is showing that almost 80% of the mortality rates that we have in farms today are due to sours and respiratory issues. Sorry to interrupt you again, Miguel, but still the audio doesn't work too well. I don't know. It works. I'm gonna... it, it works. I'm very sorry to uh, to interrupt you to all the audience. So we tried that before and it worked pretty well. So maybe um, we'll give Miguel a second so he can just fix what's happening here. I'm gonna connect my speakers. Hello. Hey. Yes, I hope it's going to be better now. Yes, I so let's try it. Is 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 okay now? Yes, yeah, much, much better. better. Much better. Okay. So sorry, we we did a test five minutes before and it was perfect. Um, do, do you need me to repeat this slide, Claudio and Molina? Yeah, I, I will start. I will start from the beginning again. Okay, so the first part of this presentation related to uh, challenges in farms. So um, I want to show you this um, uh, research that was made in the USA, but we have very similar figures here in Europe. And we, we observed that 80% of the problems are related to two causes mostly, which are digestive problems and respiratory issues. And more than 55% of the problems are coming from uh, digestive problems. And about 22% is, is, is coming from respiratory issues. The rest are related to other complications that we have during the uh, Calvin or some environmental issues. Um, I wanna jump into uh, a research that you can find at the Journal of, of Animals, a Journal of Dairy Science. Um, that's important here to point out that there are, during the first week of life, there are critical windows, there are potential stressors of those diseases that we were talking before. So digestive and respiratory problems. Um, I did this summary but you can go through the um, uh, notes that you have at the bottom of the chart and where you can extract a little bit more information. No? During, um, these stressors um, that you see here will produce long-term effect in calf performances and in a short term will trigger the immune system. We are gonna go through some of them and in particular, we're gonna talk mostly about birth, housing, and winning. I'm not gonna talk very much or almost nothing about transportation, about commingling, which is more related to feedlots, despite we might have some kind of, uh, let's say, um, influence in, in, in calf rearing. And I'm not gonna talk also even about uh, castration or uh, dehorning, okay? Because um, I think it's not much more related to the topic of, of this meeting. Um, starting at birth, uh, we all know that uh, it is a, a stressor that is common to all type of farms. And when I, when I say to all type of farms, I'm talking about dairies, and I'm talking also a bit calf farms, okay? Um, we all know that uh, if cows receive an enough amount of colostrum, this will have a positive impact in the next stages of the rearing, okay? So the better we manage the colostrum supply to animals, the best for the rest of the um, critical windows that animals will, will face. The second one that I'm going to, uh, we will talk 
layer a little bit deeper about the management of Colossians. This is why I'm not investing too much time here. Housing. Uh, housing depends on several criteria. We can do individual housings, we can do grouping, or uh, we can do uh, grouping by increasing the space as well. And, and this depends on several things. Uh, depends on the size of the farm, depends on the sex. If we are uh, keeping the ownership of the females and we are selling the, females, the, the males on the farm, but if we could keep both, uh, it's also related to the fact that if farmers are marketing all the animals of the farm, or if we have in, in some cases or so shortages or forages. When we do housing, it's important to have in mind two things. Yeah? Generally, we will be mixing animals. And in this case, older cows are the main spreaders of scours. So for this, it's very important to limit the number of animals in each group. And it's good if we do segregation by ages, which is a good tool. But again, we only can do this when possible. Sometimes the shortage of forages or the accommodations or any critical uh, uh, um, problem during the, during the year may change our capabilities to, to do housing for, for animals. Um, <clears throat> the next one that I'm gonna talk a little bit is winning. Mm -hmm. uh, probably is the, the, the most stressful period in the, in the product life from an industry per perspective. And how we manage this can have a dramatic or a, a, or a very good e effect on the economic viability of, of the animals and at the farm at the end. You know? And here, uh, I want to, to have a, a distinction. So uh, the first distinction is um, uh, we do different uh, type of weaning management depending if we are going to market the cows or depending if we are keep the ownership of the cows. And this is, this is going to affect later so the um, probabilities of the animals to have bigger or lower uh, exposure to uh, scours diseases or digestive problems or respiratory problems. And all these critical windows or potential stressor are extremely important when we need to define which is our strategy and what kind of solutions can we use in order to uh, minimize the negative impact of enteric disease and, and respiratory issues. Some good practices for winning is that when possible, we can do uh, pre-winning diets and also uh, in some cases uh, together with uh, uh, vaccinations and vaccinations should be, if possible, done uh, to to three weeks before the winning time, okay? And the winning can be done as well in general and basically in three ways. Could, could be an, uh, an abrupt winning, just when, when we totally separate the cow from the cow, okay? It's a little, it's, it's much more stressful than others and will have a ma major impact in the immunity of the animals, okay? which is not the same as we do a uh, fence like weaning, which is much more common in, for instance, in traditional farms. The uh, total separation or, or the abrupt weaning is much more common in large farms. That uh, fence like weaning is, is, as I said, I'm sorry to, to repeat that, it's, it's much more common in, in traditional farms, which are still a, uh, the majority of the farms that we have in Europe. Um, that is also a kind of winning which is made in, in two stages or step down approach in where uh, we can put um, ring noses to, to the calf while we leave the calf for a few weeks, three to four weeks more with the calf. And after that, um, we remove the uh, ring nose and we, um, we move the calves uh, or we separate the calf totally from, from the mother, from the calf. Um, occasionally, we can be forced to do early winnings, 
because we because of lack of space in the farm uh, or because of uh, again some shortages on, on, on raw materials or on, on forages and we have to bear in mind if we have to do that so this will get an impact in the immune system of of the cows from this point we are gonna jump into the uh, second uh, subject of this um, webinar, which is the, um, the colostrum management. And in here, I'm gonna show you a chart that probably all of you already know, which is the uh, uh, immunity gap that um, calves in this particular case that mammals have during the first days, weeks of life, and where, um, as we all know, so the, there is no transference of immunity through the cow to the fetus, uh, and then cows are born without any immune protection. Um, colostrum, uh, therefore, is essential, and which main function is to provide energy, is provide immunity, and the third one is, is a, an extremely potential source of growth factors, okay? So in, in this chart on the left side, what you can see is that from day four, five, until uh, 10 weeks of like, so the immune system of the calves is not mature enough. And it's in that period in where we are going to have uh, a lot of these uh, 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 critical events or critical windows that I, I pointed out before and that are stressors of the immune system. So it's something important to, to understand. So if we are not providing an enough quantity and quality of colostrum to the calves during the first uh, six, 12 hours, we will have uh, troubles in next weeks due to the fact of this lack of immunity. Um, what is important to know about colostrum? Uh, the first thing is when to apply. Uh, I think we do not need to extend time on that, but I'm gonna talk deeper about uh, quantity and quality. And to me, quantity and quality are extremely correlated. So the uh, information I want to, I'm, I'm going to share with you in the coming slides is, is a combination of quantity and quality. I will jump from one other to another one, okay? Before that, we are going to see what are the uh, two main reasons why the colostrum should be applied in the first hours of life. And the first one is, um, is, is a metabolic reason. And, and this metabolic reason is uh, because of the uh, huge decrease on the rate of absorption of immunoglobulins uh, from the intestine of cows, which is uh, extremely good in the first six hours. And this is the best recommendation. So colostrum should be applied in the first six hours of life. And if not possible, at least in the first 12 hours. But we see that there is a decrease of about 20% in the rate of absorption of immunoglobulins, okay? So if we are unable to uh, pro, uh, provide the right colostrum amount in the first six hours, and we have to do it in the 12 hours, we have to bear in mind that the absorption of immunoglobulins is gonna be lower. And by then we are not providing the same protections to, to cows. So probably in that case, we need to use some tools to reinforce the, uh, this passive immunity. And the second reason, is a physiological reason, which is related to the uh, quantity of immunoglobulins that are produced by, by cows. And here you have, uh, um, this is general figures that may vary in between breeds or in between different genetics. But what you can observe here is that from the first meal to the second milk, from the se first milking to the second milking, there is a huge drop in the production of immunoglobulins. So, no doubt that it should be the first one. That's their recommendation. And these two reasons are why the colossion should be given as soon as possible and as much as we can do. Uh, 
uh, having in mind that we have to test the, uh, the quality. But what's going on in the market? Okay. Uh, in the last years, we, we have the last 20, 30 years, um, we have seen a, an extremely improvement in the milk yield of, in particular, and uh, high milk production cows, uh, Holstein or Jersey's, for instance, or Brunswick's. And so today, and that's a very simple rule. So the, the higher amount of milk produced in, in the first mill, uh, uh, the lower the probability of getting a, a very high amount of, of antibody titers per liter, okay? Uh, as an example here, you say that if, if a cow is producing in between five to eight cages in the first milking, so the probability to have more than 35 grams per liter so rise up to 77%. However, if we are talking about um, a hosting, for instance, uh, a heifer with the, an amount of first milk could be from 30 to 16 cages. So the probability to have a very good quality on the colostrum decrease to almost 60%, 58%. And here, a very good example is, for instance, a host chain uh, has an average of 5.6% of IgG, while a Jersey cow got 9% of IgG content. So the breed is important. So depending on which breed are we managing, we need to be aware about that. Um, uh, for, for those that are continually working on, on a farm level, and the, you do uh, often tests of the quality of colostrum, you may observe that every year the quality of colostrum is decreasing. And it's a very common topic that we listen every year. Uh, people is day by day using more enhancers. And the only reason is there is a lack of colostrum available today, natural or maternal colostrum. Um, an exercise in this case was a, a research that was made in, in a university in, in Munich with more than um, 1,000 cows from the year 2005 to the year 2015 they were analyzing the, what is the immunodeficiency, okay, uh, along the years. And what they observed is that from 2005 to, to, to uh, 2015, there was a deterioration in the passive immunity transference, okay? And you may see, for instance, that there is a dramatic drop, which is about minus 20%, from 61% to 41% of cows with more than 10 milligrams of IgG per milliliter, okay? And we, in this uh, research, you may observe that the um, cows that are having in between five and 10 milligrams is a little bit higher, okay? And the, cow, the cows that are less than five milliliter is a little bit higher. So the message of this is, the quality that we have that we had in 2015 was much lower than in 2005. Other studies are showing that um, this failure of passive transference uh, may rise up to 38 percent. Okay, so depending on where, where is the bibliography or the the the, the country where you you do the researches, you, you may observe. Uh, some differences in between figures, but what is a fact is that uh, this is happening since years. Uh, we all know about this, and and it's something that we really need to to keep in mind in 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 the future, because uh, uh, milk yield is increasing in many countries. Yet in Europe, is increasing in Spain, is increasing in the UK, uh, uh, it, it's increasing in, in a lot of uh, countries in the East East Europe. So colostrum management is extremely important. Um, there are these uh, research that we have seen before, it's also related to, or could be related to another study that was also made in, in, in Germany. And in this research, 
it was only made with uh, uh, 139 calves and here it was analyzed the total protein content in calf blood. And, um, this is showing us that if the content of uh, total protein in the blood is below 55 grams per liter, around 48% of the animals were having episode of diarrhea. If the amount of total protein is in between 55 and 60, we are able to decrease by almost 20 points of percentage, the index of diarrhea in animals. And if we do an excellent uh, colostrum management in the amount of total protein in the blood is over 60 grams, so the index of the diarrhea is relatively low. Well, um, I also like to, and I think it's important to bear in mind some uh, figures about what might be the economical impact in case of failure of uh, passive transfer. And here, I, we basically point out like uh, two references. You may see that the difference are quite big. In one case, we are talking in between 60 to 90 euros. And in another case, we are talking about over 700 euros. Um, we will review later uh, a much more uh, detailed uh, figures related to uh, calf scours and respiratory issues in where we have a breakdown of the different cost drivers in case of failure of passive transference. But um, it's something that when we are managing farms, so we need to look at what are our historical consumptions of drugs to uh, avoid, prevent, or cut off diarrhea issues in this case, or, or respiratory problems, and, and understand how much money can we invest if we do in a preventive way to see if is there any way of saving money and at the end having less problems of, of scours, for instance, okay? Um, the reasons that are involved in these big differences that you see on the screens is mostly related to uh, higher mortality rates or higher susceptibility of the animal to get disease or, or, day, or lower daily gain uh, in, in between the different studies. As a conclusion, well, um, the first one is, as I said, to uh, colostrum should be given as soon as possible, as much as possible. Important is from a healthy cow. And at this point, I want to highlight, do not discard colostrum for first cow heifers without testing the quality. Because the qual if the quality is good, we can do a kind of different management, okay? Um, colostrum, uh, should be uh, came from uh, healthy cows because colostrum could be also a potential uh, source of infectious agents. Okay, and when we, we, we when we know that, uh, it's important that um, we need to have a good management to preserve the the colostrum in the farm. Okay, some general rules that you all know is uh, it must be frozen or refrigerated within one hour after collecting and we need to avoid overheating. In, in large farms, so the pasteurization is, is very well known and is very well used today, but uh, it's not very common, for instance, in, in traditional farms today, in which are the majority of the farms in Europe. But it's a very, it's a very useful tool, it's a very safe tool, and will help us to solve a lot of problems, a lot of problems. Um, and then we have different kind of uh, tools, which uh, I call here additional colostrum supply, which are, let's say, are not maternal antibodies that are given directly to, uh, to calves, are antibodies that at some point we are processed at, uh, by the feed animal industry factor, at, at, at factories in the animal industry. Um, important here, what is the origin of the product? To get certification of uh, product free of uh, notifiable diseases. Um, 
Also, we have to bear in mind that they will more, mostly act at the intestinal level. So these uh, antibodies will not be absorbed through the intestinal wall, go to the bloodstream, and then uh, transfer the immunity via blood. Um, and, the, and the third point, uh, which is much more difficult to test today in, in, in reality, is the quality and the content of antibodies that are, are provided by, by suppliers, okay? But um, we will give you some, some ideas today about how can you figure out that. Okay, so what possible solutions can we get when we are unable to um, provide a very good quantity and quality of colostrum to animals? Uh, and to me, the first thing is the theoretically, if we give in between three to four liters with a very good quality, so it's it is not necessary to make any reinforcements of immunity to to the cows. Okay, that's more than enough, and nothing is better than the natural uh, uh, maternal uh, immunity. However, for several things that we we've been talking today, and there is an increasing demand of, uh, of external or external um, antibodies. Let's say those that are not coming directly uh, from, from, from the colostrum, okay? And in this case, we have like kind of two sources in the market. So it's a cow colostrum, which is based on IgG, and which main role is support the immune system at the intestinal level. And here it's important to understand which is the quality because generally what we get is the concentration. We have the total content of immunoglobulins that we are unable to figure out uh, what is the specific composition of, of antibodies. Because the, as you may figure out, in a farm there is a vaccination program. And if you want to get colostrum from one specific farm with one specific vaccination program, the quantity of colostrum that they can supply is limited, okay? So if we want to put colostrum in the market, we have to get a very big number of uh, herds, heads under the same vaccination conditions, okay? To get a standard product. Today is not really the best, uh, well today, uh, we do not have enough capabilities to manufacture a, a standard product when we talk about quality. So the content, no doubt, is a standard and is guaranteed, but the quality of this content is something that uh, we need to, to think about. Um, this problem, for instance, might be solved with uh, when we talk about egg powders. Egg powders are not a source of IgG, are a source of IgY. The functionality of these antibodies is the same as IgG. And there are scientific research that are talking about this and are demonstrating that in terms of efficiency, IgG can replace Ig, IgY can replace IgG in terms of functional, functional, functionality, sorry. And the good thing of these kind of products is that the manufacturing is much more under control. Uh, because you can vaccinate individual flocks of hens with an individual vaccine, and not with a pool of vaccines as we can do today in, in dairies, okay? So let's say that the quality and the standardization of the product is much better when we're talking about egg powder products than when we are talking about uh, cow colostrum, okay? Other ingredients that we see very commonly in products that are uh, or get a function of uh, as a colostrum enhancer as uh, products with a very or uh, ingredients with a very high nutritional value so we uh, complex of vitamins vitamin a to 3e or different kind of energy sources okay um, at the end what is the function of colostrum as we said is to provide the energy in a, in a in as much digestible as possible. So very high nutritional value and on top of that is immunity. 
the the only let's say thing that you we cannot find today in, in those in answer are the, the growth factors we, we do not have growth factors to to add in this kind of an answer well so until here we have seen um, what are the critical windows what are the uh, potential stressors we have seen how important it is to get a good management of colostrum understanding what is the current problems that we have today what are problems related to the quality of the product so we need to adjust our management of colostrum according to those uh, windows or stressor or management problems that we may have in in farm we are going to talk now about uh, neonatal diarrhea and in here so as you will know so neonatal diarrhea is a combination of different factors could be a combination of pathogens of housing of feeding or envi environmental uh, uh, and environmental reasons as well and um, diarrhea is not a disease by itself it's a symptom uh, and could be a protective function of of the body but uh, it may lead up to six to twelve percent of fluid losses okay which is uh, as it's, it's, it's extremely hard it's extremely hard it's a really hard uh, dehydration of the animal in this slide uh, probably you will know about this already uh, we we can see that most of the problems related to calf scours are happening in the first two weeks of life. So more than 42% of the cases are related to uh, calf scours. However, respiratory disease uh, uh, they have a lower impact, uh, uh, which is uh, below 15%. Uh, this picture changed completely from the second week onwards. Uh, where uh, diarrhea issues has a lower impact and suddenly a respiratory disease uh, camps up, okay? Um, of course, there are reasons for that that we will show later. Um, here you see some reviews, okay? In where we can observe uh, what might be the uh, impact uh, there is um, nothing important to highlight here. So uh, the only thing is that if you review bibliography in different years, so in 1985, in 2009, or in 2006, they all talk about the same uh, kind of percentages. So very high percentages, okay, of scours in, in the first two weeks. And in Europe, the four more important pathogens that are identified are uh, rota corona, uh, cryptosporidium, and the enterotoxic uh, strain of E. coli K99. Um, and I can say that today, uh, at least in central northern Europe, the main problem is related to uh, cryptosporidiums today. Um, if we look at the um, what might be the different pathogens uh, within the time that may uh, affect our calves? Uh, corona E. coli, rotavirus, and cryptosporidius will mostly act in, in the first 21 days. Uh, corona E. coli, rotavirus at the very beginning, cryptosporidium a little bit later, so from two weeks onwards. And this is mostly a combination of uh, viral diseases together with um, protozoa diseases. And majority of the uh, calf scours problems related to bacteria are coming much more later. Okay? And I could say much more as a secondary diseases. This is a review made by the um, University of Kansas. Okay. And it's just to give you an idea about what's going on in the North American market. Um, um, again, we talk about the same. So Corona, Rota, Crypto. Uh, e. coli seems to have a lower impact here in this market. Um, 
and which is a, another thing which is good to observe here is that the single infections are much more common than mixed infections, okay? Um, we do not see here uh, other viruses as could be um, uh, VDD or IVR because today they have a much lower impact uh, and it's mostly thanks to the um, vaccination programs that we have in France today. Well, um, as I said, we, we're going to go through a much more deeper uh, economic analysis okay, about what might be the costs involved in a cath scours. And we have here, uh, again, a research made in, <coughs> sorry, in Germany, in where we have uh, two kind of groups, let's say, so animals that are under a heavy episode of diarrhea and animals that are under a light episode of diarrhea. Um, but it's important to, to figure out here that there are high costs on managing the drugs, electrolytes, or products to rehydrate the animals, uh, together with the uh, cost of veterinarian, but the, uh, that's a, a kind of fixed cost for, for all farms. Um, and it's also important the high cost of mortality when we are talking about uh, heavy cases of diarrhea. Uh, if you remember, we were talking in between 90 euros and 700 euros. So to me, uh, these figures are much more accurate, okay? And we could take this kind of, um, of uh, overall cost as a um, good point to, to start thinking on, on preventive strategies, okay? Um, if, if you have historical cases of heavy diarrhea or light diarrhea, so go back to your records, check how much money you, did you invest to cut off this problem, and from that point to so think if we, you can use some preventive measures uh, uh, which are a combination basically of, of management, colostrum, or some kind of uh, enhanced products. Um, I have not talked yet uh, or very shortly about the distinction, the distinction in between females and, and males in, in, in dairies but it is a fact that um, uh, in many farms, so males are considered a byproduct. However, females are considered a high value, able, high, high value product. So if we penalize the growth of these future heifers in the first months of life, this will have a bigger, uh, an impact in the, in the first milk uh, in, in the first lactation, in the milk production of the first lactation. And here you see a very good example, okay, in where we have uh, animals that were um, having different daily weight gains in the first six months. And there is a big difference in between those animals that its average daily weight was over 900 grams, which uh, first lactation, we, they reached up to um, more than 9,000 liters. And for instance, uh, uh, heifers that were growing at uh, rates about 700, eight, 700 or 800 grams, so they achieve only uh, like uh, 400 uh, liters less in the first lactation, which is a lot of money at the end. So important to, to understand that. Are we gonna uh, take care of the hay, future heifer in the same way as we do with the, with the males or not? So can we, how are we doing housing? Are, are we grouping them or not? So those kind of things are important in order to get uh, um, a major profits at the end of the rearing period. Um, what solutions are in the market today? Um, uh, basically, what uh, we all know, so there are different products combining uh, electrolytes, probiotics, fibers, which are good in order to compensate the losses of liquids, of salts, probiotics to restore the um, intestinal level. Um, probiotics are much more common in one country than in others. Uh, don't ask me why, but that is a fact. In some countries, for instance, in, in the USA, 
you, you can see that a lot of these products to control cafe scours are including uh, probiotics and it's, 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 it's less common in Europe. It's less common. Not all the products are including probiotics. Um, most of the products you are containing a combination of different electrolytes. And some of them, they are including fibers, mostly based on pectins. Um, there are also products based on clays. Basically, the clays, what I'm, what I'm going to do is to uh, increase their water retention, okay, and we'll make the um, pieces more consistent. Um, there are also strategies, which is stop feeding the miller replacer, uh, and which is, uh, which is a very uh, common practice in large farms. So they stop feeding the miller replacer for a few days. They restore the gut with uh, very specific diets, uh, high content of probiotic, electrolytes, very high digestible nutrients, and they continue feeding the miller replacer because the objective for them is to restart the animals to eat as soon as possible. And there are antibiotic therapies. And here uh, we are starting to observe that um, in particular in Europe, cryptosporidios uh, is the main problem today. And there are very limited antibiotics for uh, cope with this problem and generally are very expensive. So we observe that a lot of farms are already working on preventive measures, okay? Combining, for instance, the products that I've been talking before together with uh, egg immunoglobulins, okay? Which is um, a product that is uh, in the last year getting more acceptance in the market, um, as well as, as, as vaccines. So coming back, sorry, to the egg immunoglobulin. So I just want to, to show you um, a research made uh, in where um, it was quantified how much is the protection of neonatal cows when we challenge them with the, the enterotoxic K99 um, um, uh, of E. coli. As far as we are increasing the number of titers that we are giving to cows, okay? So you see here on the gray bar on the left, you have the control uh, dieting where you we do not have any antibody titers. And then on antibody titer one, antibody titer two, antibody titer four, we are increasing the amount of antibodies that um, in, in the feed to uh, um, evaluate if is there any improvement in terms of uh, weight gains. And we observe that there is a positive trend. So the more amount of antibodies of, of antibodies that are given uh, to calves, the better response instead of uh, weight gains. There are uh, also studies in where, uh, in where um, um, there was taking pictures of the uh, epithelial cells together with the um, fimbrias of E. coli. Um, we took the same pictures with the epithelial cells with fimbria of E. coli and together with the antibodies from the egg powder. And you may observe a very big difference in between uh, both egg scenarios. So fully confident on, on immune globulins coming from egg because uh, there's, there are a lot of scientific trials that can demonstrate the, the efficiency. So I'm gonna use the next slide, this one, to jump into the last topic of the talk of today, which is the respiratory issues. And um, why this slide? Because there are evidences that um, those cows that were under a challenge of, uh, of diarrhea, uh, they are potential animals to get higher levels of infection of respiratory issues. And, and that is a fact that we observe in farms, okay? Um, we will take a deeper look later on what might be the economic impact of bronchopneumonia, but we will make um, a review about uh, what's going on around the respiratory track of the animals. Um, 
yeah, so it was jammed to respiratory problems. So, and the first, the first thing to, to talk here is the, um, sorry, uh, is the um, respiratory diseases are, are mostly coming in groups. And if you remember, I, I, skipped, I skipped to a uh, uh, critical window was housing and coming link. So these two, uh, these two ev events, are extremely related to the development of a respiratory problems. So, so when we are doing grouping, we we have a much bigger exposure of animals to get respiratory problems. So it's a multifactorial uh, uh, disease, and as you see here, so there are factors related to the to the animal, to the environment, to the pathogen pressures of the farm. And it's also related to the feed management that we are dealing with in the first weeks of life. Uh, there are things that we cannot avoid, okay? So environmental things, so we can do much better biosecurity programs, or we can do a better cleaning of the housings, but uh, at the end, when weather changes, weather changes. <laughs> so there are, we, we cannot manage this very much sometimes. Um, the origin of animals, so something that we already know so in particular when we are mixing uh, animals from different origins and in feedlots so we always face this kind of uh, respiratory issues uh, what is important to know and uh, why are animals so sensible to or cows so sensible to respiratory diseases because the uh, the lung is relatively small compared with the uh, rest of the body weight okay um, and it has a very intensive exchange of airflow with the environment, okay? The, the lung is divided in much more segments than, uh, for instance, in, in, in humans or in another, in another ruminant of sheep. And the elasticity is, is much more reduced by them, okay? And it's an organ that takes almost a year to complete the, the, the maturation, okay? And depends a lot on, on, on the body growth. So the better the animals are growing, the better development of the lamb. So we back again to uh, uh, the daily weight gain in the first three, four weeks is extremely important to avoid further problems uh, related to um, respiratory diseases. Uh, some comparisons that we might have with the, uh, with the other species here. Um, for instance, if you compare which is the uh, respiratory volume so in a dog uh, in relation with the total lung volume, which is, is about 40. And however, in a cattle is, is, is twice, so it's 29. In the respiratory minutes uh, volume in relation to the total lung volume, so in a dog, it's, uh, it's, it's almost three, and in a cattle, it's almost nine. So this means that the exchange of fluids or airflow is, 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 is much more often, and the amount of, uh, of uh, um, environmental, like DAS or uh, pathogens, so they are much more in contact with the land than in other species. We will see some figures later. Uh, this is uh, basically um, uh, some more, uh, let's say, detailed information, uh, for instance, so that the number of blood vessels that uh, reach the, the alveolus is relatively small compared with other species as well, okay? And, and there is an, 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 an imbalance, okay, compared with other uh, species. Um, here is where I was... Uh, trying to explain before uh, the daily exposure to harmful pathogens um, depends very much on the breathing exchange. Okay, um, we have here three uh, scenarios: uh, one which is uh, uh, air containing 10,000 coliform units per uh, cubic meter; another one which is having a half million of coliform units, and another one which is having three millions of coliform units. And if we check which is the breathing volume per day of a calf weight in different uh, weights, so 50, 80, and 160, we see that the uh, inhaled pathogens per day is extremely huge. 
So there are a lot of probabilities that if the immune system of the animal is not ready to cope with this uh, strong um, flow of pathogens, uh, animals will get sick at some point. Um, harmful pathogens could come from different um, uh, locations and the concentration is different, okay? So if we are having animals in outdoor, the concentration is relatively low compared if we have, for instance, calf in an igloo, okay? Where the concentration is, is, is definitely much, much bigger. So we're talking about a thousand coloniform units maximum to three million coloniform units maximum. This is why for in these cases when we are housing uh, calves in igloos, so the um, ventilation, the disinfections, uh, all these kind of uh, biosecurity uh, measures and, 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 and management are extremely important to decrease the load of these potential pathogens for uh, respiratory issues, okay? Um, what are the main pathogens? Um, the main pathogens uh, of primary, um, let's say that when we talk about respiratory disease, it's a combination of different pathogens today. It's not like when we talk about uh, scours. In, in scours, it's mostly single infections. We could say in, in respiratory issues, it's much more a mix of different pathogens, but uh, uh, we could highlight here they are the two most important probably uh, are the uh, CNCTL and, and the pro influenza um, 3 virus, okay, together with some uh, secondary bacteria, some um, Mahemi, Amalitica, Pesterella, uh, or some Mycoplasma bovis. Um, could be also some, we could face some issues with Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and, and there are other viruses that have uh, today some impact on respiratory diseases, but less than CNCTL and, and pro influenza thanks to the um, uh, good vaccination problems that, that we have today. Um, we will talk a little bit, as I said, uh, about the bronchopneumonia, uh, which is a secondary bacterial pathogen that we see mostly uh, after viral infection. So um, I'm including here Pastrella with a very high resistance. Um, the economic impact of the insoluted bronchopneumonia, and this, uh, this is again a, a research made in, in Germany, is, is telling that, that the cost may go from a very light case up to uh, 90 euros from a very heavy case, uh, 234 euros. So we are talking roughly about the same kind of uh, cost levels as uh, we were talking in the scours cases, okay? So in case of heavy issues, cost is very high. So we have much less tools here to manage respiratory problems than when we're talking about the scours, okay? That is a fact. So, and we have to bear in mind that. So probably with respiratory issues, it's much more important to think about uh, how to prevent animals to get in a, in a big challenge, okay, in the, from two weeks onward, because the, the tools that we have today is mostly based on antibiotics and vaccines, and there are not many uh, tools based on non-antibiotic solutions. And, um, uh, as we all know, so the uh, regulation in Europe every year is uh, tougher, regarding the use of antibiotic and still in many farms, we, we, we see uh, a preventive use of antibiotics to basically prevent some respiratory disease or try to minimize the uh, uh, decrease on feed consumption while animals are <clears throat> suffering any respiratory disease. Um, what are the main symptoms? So as you know, there are feed consumptions and water intake uh, uh, decrease or mild scours sometimes could be coughing and lethargy, some cases of fevers. And if we have a very acute uh, situation, so death may come in three, three to five days. Solutionary strategies. Well, so these strategies that we might take, as I said before, should be uh, done right before the, uh, in the first two weeks of life. 
So right before the challenge, we have to prepare very well the immune system of the animals to cope later with these uh, uh, potential pathogens. And vaccines are working. We are vaccinating cows today. And in some cases, we are also vaccinating cows, so three to four weeks before grouping. Um, antibiotics, there are um, oral therapies and also via injections with molecules that we, we already no, they are not so expensive and when we, as in the case of when we have, for instance, to treat cases of cryptosporidia. Um, there are some uh, feed molecules that might help to um, ease the problem, to re relieve the uh, symptoms of the cows, okay? Um, most of these products are based on, on eucalyptus and, and mint, okay? Um, um, farmers are using complementary to antibiotic treatments and to decrease the amount of uh, uh, days that they are giving antibiotic to cows. Okay, the um, main effect of these products, of the product based on on, on eucalyptus and mint, are uh, basically they will have a, a cooling effect and they will increase the sensation of nasal flow. Um, they have a kind of mucolytic effect and they are bronchodilator. And consequences of this is that uh, cows will eat better. They, there is an increase on the appetite of cows and we will have uh, better uh, feed intakes per day. Those are the main effects of this molecule. This kind of products, they uh, may have one issue, uh, which is uh, how to mix it uh, within the water or within the mill replacer. Um, it could be easily mixed with the mill or mill replacer. There is any kind of rejection, but we have to take care when we mix it with water because if we are overdosing or we do not adjust very well the dose, so uh, cats will not drink at all. So they might even reject drinking, okay? Is the, the only, uh, let's say, concern regarding this kind of, of solutions today. Um, and well, with this, we, we reached the, the end of the presentation. And uh, at this point, um, this basically want to uh, highlight some take home messages. And with this, I give the floor to um, questions and, and answers. Uh, the first point is the, the passive transfer and management is key, if, is key, is a key management point in calf scours and respiratory diseases and within the year is getting more and more important. It's extremely important to identify what are your critical windows in your farms and which are those potential stressors. And according to that, do a specific management of the colostrum or reinforcement of colostrum or uh, those re, uh, products that can be as a, uh, um, um, uh, potential um, enhancers of the uh, immune, immune system. Um, in the last decade, the uh, quality of maternal colostrum in general is decreasing worldwide, and it will continue decreasing because uh, cows are producing more milk, so the milk yield is increasing every year. Um, uh, the use of alternative source of immunoglobulins like uh, IgG um, might improve the quality of, uh, of the current solutions that we have today. So as a complement of the IgG or as individual treatments. Uh, there is a very high cost of some antibiotic treatments in the first two weeks, um, in particular when we are talking about Christosporidios. Uh, so management and preventive solutions might help so again, it's, it's good to quantify uh, how much is the cost that I invest in the different cases of calf scours that I have. And according to that, to analyze if is there any chance to work in a preventive way. And um, respiratory issues may ease with products based in, in, in mint and eucalyptus, but uh, today it's uh, the uh, most efficient uh, tools that we have still are um, antibiotics and, and, and vaccines, okay? So, and well, with this, uh, thanks for all. And I give the, the floor again to, to Lena and Claudio, and I'm at your disposal to, to answer any question. Yes, 
thank you very much, Miguel. I think that was quite an interesting insight on the challenges, strategies, and solutions for calf rearing. And uh, as we took a little longer due to the um, problems in the in the first couple of minutes, we um, we'd like to say that we wouldn't do the question and answer now, but uh, frankly invite you to send us all the uh, remaining question, questions to webinar at ewnutrition.com. You're going to receive an email with that uh, address later. And yeah, we do have a, a, some questions we couldn't answer during the sessions. I am very sorry for that. But um, as I said, if you could write us an email, the questions will directly be routed to us and we are happy to answer them in a more detailed way. Yes. Um, you can also join us for our next sessions as we have more webinars coming up. And if you follow us on our website or on the LinkedIn channel, you can keep up and register for the next webinars as well. Yes, the recording of this session will also be made available on the website for tomorrow. And if there are, as I said, any questions left, please just let us know. I don't know if there's anything else Claudio would like to say. Otherwise, I'd say thank you and... No, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very okay, much, Lena. You. I just uh, want to take uh, 30 seconds to answer just a, a question that's very, very simple because how can I do with orphan uh, calves? Ah, of course, okay. uh, just uh, very, very speedily because uh, we deleted the question in the list in the, of email. Of course, the, the rule must be the same to, to give as much as possible uh, immunoglobulins to the calf as, much, uh, as soon as possible. Therefore, the bank of colostrum is suggested in this case and uh, to use in any case, if it's not possible to use the colostrum from the mother directly, we can use another kind of colostrum. Of course, it's not the same in terms of efficiency, but the rule must be uh, absolutely the same to get to the, the calf as much as possible, immuno, immunoglobulins as soon as possible after the birth. Okay, uh, I finish, thank you very much. Thank you, Claudio, I didn't see that question, but yeah, perfect, you could still answer that one. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much and we're looking forward to see you in one of our coming up webinars. Thank you very much. Thank the you. webinar. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.